good afternoon and good day uh, all of you joining us from Hong Kong you and Hong Kong and other parts of the world uh, we're certainly very excited about today's uh, seminar on meta analytic research domains uh, going beyond traditional meta analytic approaches um, our speaker today is Professor Pim Kuypers, who probably doesn't need any introduction given his uh, extremely prolific and impactful career. Uh, professor Kuypers is a professor of clinical psychology at the Department of Clinical Neuro and Development Psychology uh, at the uh, Freyer uh, University. He has uh, published over a thousand scholarly papers. Many of them are considered contemporary classics. Um, and uh, starting this year, uh, professor, professor Kuypers is a visiting professor in the Faculty of Social Sciences here at Hong Kong U. Um, and so we very much look forward to welcoming him in person. Um, and today uh, he will share with us some of his latest work on uh, aggregating knowledge. Uh, this topic is perhaps particularly important as uh, the scientific literature across all fields is growing exponentially. Uh, new tools and new way of thinking about uh, the ways we accumulate and aggregate data and knowledge. Uh, I think it's not only helpful, but perhaps essential. So uh, I very much look, uh, look forward to hearing his sharing. Uh, Professor Kuypers will speak for around 45 minutes. Uh, we'll then open the floor for questions and discussion. And we'll try to end today's uh, seminar at um, 4.30 uh, Hong Kong time. So please uh, join me in uh, virtually welcoming Professor Pim Kuypers. Professor, over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Christian, for the kind introduction. Um, and I'm happy to talk today about this subject. I have a bit of a flu, so when you hear my voice is a bit sore, then that's correct. And sometimes I may have to drink some water to keep my voice uh, good. But uh, other than that, I'm very happy to talk about this subject today. And it's, it's actually the first time that I really talk about this subject because we are so used to think about do, doing randomized trials, meta-analysis. But as Christian said, the number of trials is, is each year increasing exponentially. So we now have so many trials. So for example, in the field of psychotherapy, there are more than 5,000 trials. <laughs> on mental disorder of psychotherapies on mental disorders. And not only the number of trials is increasing, but also the number of meta-analysis. And so then at some point, uh, usually meta-analysis cover, you know, 10, 20, 30, maybe 100 studies. But then we have so many meta-analysis that we just don't oversee a whole field anymore. So we really need to step up to a higher level of aggregation of our knowledge. Simple meta-analysis are not enough anymore. And so I will start sharing my screen now to show you my slides. So what I wanna to do today is I will talk, first talk about, it's a new term, it doesn't exist. I mean, it's something I, uh, when I think about uh, a higher level of aggregation, there is no term for that. So I made up the term myself, meta-analytic research domain. And what I will do is I will explain you what it is and why it's so important, what the advantages are and what the dangers are if you, if you work on this higher level of aggregation. Then I will show you our meta psi project as an example. I won't, I won't go into the content, so I won't talk about <clears throat> what the outcomes of the meta-analysis are, but I'll show you yeah, how, how this project look, looks like, how, how we make it, how, how we make it available for other people, and how we, I will show you the websites where you can look at it yourself. And then finally, I will talk about uh, an R package that was specifically made for this MetaPsy project, uh, allowing us to, if we make the data in the right format, then we can automatically run a lot of analysis at the same time without uh, making this new syntax. And, generating tables automatically. So, and I, I think it's pretty exciting and it will make 
meta-analysis much easier. So that's what I want to do this morning. So first, these meta-analytic research domains. And I assume uh, if you have questions, uh, maybe it's better to wait until the end because it's very difficult for me to, to look at the chat also. Uh, but I do assume that you all have some experience with uh, systematic reviews because uh, yeah, that, then you understand better uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. So if you look at different levels of research integration, it starts at the bottom, the conventional meta-analysis. And you have all kinds of variations of that. Uh, usually you have one contrast. Uh, so you have one PICO uh, participants, intervention, comparator and outcome. And then you, there you do a meta-analysis. That's what we usually do. You do, you know, the effects of CBT uh, for depression, compared to care as usual. Or uh, you can do that also in individual patient data meta-analysis where, where, where you get the patient level data uh, and you then you can say much more about predictors of outcome, for example, but it's still one contrast. It's one thing that you, uh, uh, you, you, you include studies comparing one therapy with another or with a control group or whatever. Uh, you can also make it a living systematic review or a living meta-analysis, which means that you update it every three months, six months, one year. But you do that in order to keep track of what is happening. And you integrate new studies, which are published in the last three months, into the existing meta-analytic data set. But it's still all about one comparison. If you step up a little, then you go to network meta-analysis. In a network meta-analysis, you include multiple comparisons. So it's, it's not one uh, CBT versus carriage usual, but you can also compare CBT with other types of therapies with other control groups, and you integrate that in one large network meta-analysis. So you, you, in a way, you step up to a, a higher level of aggregation, but it's still about one problem, one patient group. And it's, so it's, it's stepping up, but it's not, yeah, not very much because you do a meta-analysis for this group of patients, uh, for one specific type of intervention with a specific outcome. So at the next level is an umbrella review. And in an umbrella review, you actually do a systematic review of systematic reviews. So, or a systematic review of meta-analysis. And then you take a whole domain, and you collect systematically all the meta-analysis that have been done in that domain, and you summarize them narratively. But they have all kinds of disadvantages. So for example, these meta-analysis that you include in your umbrella review, they have different methodologies. They use different ways of including studies, analyzing studies, uh, calculating effect sizes. And because it's an, it's an umbrella review of meta-analysis, it's always old because these meta-analysis have stopped including studies, but you in your umbrella review at some point have also stopped including meta-analysis. <clears throat> so it's all, always a bit old. And the included meta-analysis may very well miss a body of studies in this field uh, uh, because it's simply not included in one of these individual meta-analysis. So, uh, so I think, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, is that you, uh, what you can do is a what I call a meta-analytic research domain uh, in which you examine, in which you do the searches in a full body on one topic. So in, in my case, what I will talk about later, psychotherapy for depression. So anything on psychotherapy for depression is collected. And then you, you have all the studies in this field together, and you can write meta-analysis 
on all these different subtopics, but you also have this overview where you, you know which studies have been done. And as, as soon as there is enough studies in one subdomain, you can do a new meta-analysis. So in a way, when you focus on a, yeah, on psychotherapy for depression, you not only look at CBT versus control, but also at any psychotherapy versus pharmacotherapy or combined, et cetera, et cetera. So you cover the whole field. And that's what I want to talk about. And to, in this graph, what you see here is that you, if you, most meta-analysis are done to answer a clinical question. You want to know whether CBT is effective compared to as usual. And that's also true for network meta-analysis and also true for umbrella reviews. And it's also true for meta-analytic research domains. But at the same time, you have also this higher level of research, meta-research, in which you do research on research. And then it's not the clinical outcomes that matter, but you examine how research is done. And that's also a different field. And it's, you don't talk about the content, but you talk about how research is done, what the weaknesses, what the strengths are. <clears throat> and meta-analytic research domain, they are in a way both uh, clinical, clinical oriented, you give outcomes, but you can also do research on this domain. Uh, so on how this research is done, how you examine, how psychotherapy for depression is examined, weaknesses, strengths. So it's in a way in between meta research and yeah, clinical outcome uh, meta analytic research. What is a meta analytic research domain? Well, as I said, it's one, it's one whole research area and you do one big search on this. And you would search all uh, uh, bibliographic databases. It's broader than a pairwise or network meta-analysis. Um, it's, uh, it's also broader than a, uh, uh, a, a normal network meta-analysis. And it's a, it's a, what is important is that it's a living systematic review. So you have to do this Every year. We do this every year. We want to increase, increase the speed. So we probably will move to three or four times per year. But you have to update it regularly so that you keep track of what's happening in the field. It has all kinds of advantages. It's, it gives a broad overview of a field with consistent methodology. So it's, it's better. It's comparable to umbrella reviews, but then better because it has consistent methodology and covers all the gaps in uh, uh, umbrella reviews. You keep it, you can keep track of what's happening in the field. So for example, uh, <clears throat> we did meta-analysis on transdiagnostic therapies of depression and anxiety because we saw in our searches that are that the number of trials in that field was increasing rapidly. And uh, we could also uh, track them because we identify them in our searches. Uh, but they're often not called transdiagnostic therapies. So if you would call, if you would do searches for them, you would not identify them unless you would do all the searches we do. And so that's that's really one of the big advantages of uh, uh, doing uh, an analysis like this is that you you can do uh, an analysis which which you cannot do by simply searching. For example, secondary outcomes. Uh, so usually secondary outcomes are not reported in abstracts or title. They are just in the paper, but it's not in the in the abstract. So if you search for them. For example, the effects of uh, psychotherapy for depression on uh, quality of life or social support, you wouldn't find it if you would do a normal search uh, because social support is not in the abstract. So, uh, but what we do is we just take the studies and go through the PDFs of all the studies and then we can see what the secondary outcomes are. Uh, yeah, and it's also... 
I also think that uh, if you do that, that these searches, it's more complete than uh, all these other different uh, searches. Because we do, if we do a specific meta-analysis, we often do additional searches. And people know that we have our database and they, they say, okay, but you missed this study. And did you know that study? And so we are, <clears throat> when you do that over the years, it's more complete than, than, than a normal search, so to say. Another advantage is that you can contribute to meta research. You can examine how the research in that field is done, what the strength and what the weaknesses are. I also think that if you do this, you it's no longer needed to do these smaller meta analysis. So uh, if you if you have all the studies on uh, psychotherapy for depression, you don't have to search again for doing a meta analysis on CBT for older adults in carriage with compared with carriage usual, but we because we have these data, and it's unnecessary to do these searches again, do this ex data extraction again because it's just there, and it's done by two independent uh, researchers. So yeah, why would you do a small meta analysis? Uh, and do all the work for that while the data are simply there and you can uh, directly approach it through the internet. What always also happens a lot to me <clears throat> is that uh, you, you can simply do, uh, we have the data available, so we just run an analysis. And so for, for example, people who are working on the treatment guidelines, they ask me, can you check this? Or what about that? And what about that? And I just take the data and run the analysis. And that's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's very efficient. And it's, uh, you, can, you can do much more than, it, it, often it doesn't result in, in papers, but it's just that, that people, people just want to know, what about this? What about that? What about that? And we run the analysis without all the searches. Yeah, and I also think, and I will show that later to you, I think it, it has all kinds of new opportunities for moving open science forward because we make these data open and making them available for everybody. And that's, that means that they're publicly, they're there. You can use them. There's no need to do this all over again. Of course, it has also dangers and disadvantages, this approach. It's a ton of work. So I started with this, uh, I think, in two for psychotherapy for depression. I started in 2006 or 2007. And at that time, there were, you know, um, maybe 60 studies. And I was, I remember that I, at some point in 2008 or 2009, I was so excited because we had more than 100 trials comparing psychotherapy with a control group. Now we have more than 870 trials, more than uh, 400 trials comparing psychotherapy with. So it's if you if you would start with it now, it would be a ton of work, and uh, for for us it's less work because we have done it all over the years to build up this data set. And the, but if you would do it now for a new domain, it's a ton of work. And I've seen a lot of people for simple meta-analysis in the beginning that are too ambitious and want too much and that drown in the searches and never even reach the stage of extracting data. <coughs> it's difficult to get funding for. So uh, over the the past 50 years that I've been working on the MetaPsy, side, um, uh, we did not get any funding for, uh, for the normal meta-analysis. Um, it's We got a lot of funding for all kinds of projects, but not for meta-analysis. I, I, I see it's changing a little, so some countries have, do have some funding for it, but it's often cons considered as secondary data analysis. I think it's not, but it's uh, uh, yeah, it's it's considered not to not to be very exciting. It's just putting everything together in one new study. So what's new? But of course, that's not true. Uh, uh, 
it is possible to get funding for IPD meta-analysis. That's easier. That's uh, because that's then you get all these data, all the primary data together, and then you can really examine new things. What another problem is that it's it's easy be, to become dominant in the field. So in the field of psychotherapy for depression, most meta-analysis are now done by us because people know that we have these da this database and we we you know we have 800 trials in the database and if they would do a new meta analysis with the same size it, it would be you know you would have to work with a team of of uh, that people for a couple of years to get it like we have so it's uh, so most other researchers think okay that's not a way, that's, I'm not going to do that. And that means that if in, that weaknesses in our database, they will never be solved. And that's a real risk. Another risk is that you can start fishing for significant outcomes. So we have these data and we just look, we can just simply run analysis, look at all kinds of aspects. And if we don't find something, if we find something significant, then we can publish about it. But if we don't, we don't publish about it. And that's fishing, of course. And that that is a real risk. And we try to be careful for that. But it's uh, it's it's it is a big risk for this whole domain, so to say. So, what kinds of meta analytic research domains do exist at the moment? Well, we have this. A domain for psychological treatments of depression. But colleagues in Italy are working on psychotherapies for anxiety disorders. The VA in the US actually already has such a domain for the treatment of PTSD. They've never uh, 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 done analysis with it, but they update all the research on it every year, extract all the data. And we're now working with them to yeah to 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 integrate their results with uh, uh, our meta psi whole project. <clears throat> so yeah, that's 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 the the state of the art now. And I uh, I want to go a step further now and talk about the meta psi project and so show you where we are and how we're doing that and what you yeah how it looks like. And so we, what we try to do is we are working with a whole team of people on yeah, meta-analytic research domains on all kinds of disorders. So it should be psychotherapy. Uh, and we do that now for all kinds of mental disorders, for depression, as I said, for anxiety disorders, uh, where we have a data set of trans diagnostic treatments for depression and anxiety or anxiety. We have data on suicides, on grief disorders, on we're working on OCD, the PTSD. So these are all either ready or are in development. And we are also working with other groups on bipolar and psychotic disorders. And we hope also to add in the future eating disorders. <laughs> so, but these are the disorders, so to say. But if you look within each of these disorders, that has all kinds of specific subsets. So these are the, the, the depression is by far the largest. So all the other disorders have much less research. But for psychotherapy, for depression, you can see what happens if a field increases. And so we, we have to categorize the comparisons within this uh, domain of uh, depression. So we have a lot of studies comparing psychotherapy versus control, but that's all in outpatients. So, and we have a separate data set on inpatients because we think that's a different group of depressed patients. And you cannot uh, integrate that in one data set. You have to consider them uh, differently. And we have all these studies comparing one type of therapy with another and with pharmacotherapy and combined treatments. And we have unguided internet-based CBT, which is a pretty large sample of studies, which is psychological treatment, but you cannot really compare it with, you know, face-to-face -face CBT or IPT or whatever. 
And then we have uh, uh, comparisons between different formats. So individual versus group or internet-based versus face-to-face. -face. We have a set of dismantling studies. So where you have trials uh, comparing one therapy with the same therapy with a specific component added or a specific, specific component left out. We have a, a specific category of what we call bottom-up treatments. So these are theoretically developed uh, treatments like cognitive bias modification, which is different from traditional CBT, so to say, but there are quite a few trials. And then we have a category of other comparisons. So, for example, there are a few studies comparing psychotherapy with exercise or psychotherapy with light therapy. or And we have all these other comparisons in this category other. And so within each of these data sets for uh, depression, but also for panic and uh, generalized anxiety, we're working on these subsets within each of these disorders with the main comparisons. And actually this is, this is what, where we are now. And uh, uh, the green ones are uh, the ones which are more or less ready and which will be added to the, uh, to the uh, websites. I will show that later, later on this year. <clears throat> the orange ones are in development uh and they are that means that people are working on it and the red ones are uh, that means that we have some data but we're not actively working on it but as you can imagine this 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 is a big big thing we're working on these endless numbers of uh, data sets uh and uh, with a large group of, uh, of people uh, to get that uh, to get that done and as you can imagine, this changes uh, almost every week when we get a new student or a new researcher who's interested in working on one comparison. We explain how it works and then they start working on it for their PhD or for a paper or whatever. So this is, uh, and the, most of the work now is actually trying to coordinate streamlining all the work that is done for all these uh, data sets. Okay, now um, <clears throat> I'm going to the website. So it looks like this, and I will stop my uh, PowerPoint. I will go to, and I'll go to the website to show you how it looks like. This is the, this will, will be live next week or the week after. So it's not really live yet. You can access it if you want. But, uh, it is a beta version. And uh, well, it looks like this. I've increased the size of the letter so that you can read it better. This is the website of the uh, MetaPsy project. And uh, you see here the two data databases that will be open next week. So one on depression and uh, the suicide database is also ready. Uh, so we have now included 411 trials on comparing psychotherapy for depression versus control groups. And for suicides, uh, we also have one specific data set available. And uh, in, in the course of this year, so before January next year, we will have added all the other data sets that you have seen. Uh, in, on this website, and you can approach it yourself. Uh, yeah, so it's it's open, and it's it's a bit. So we add data when they're a bit older, allowing us to write papers about it before we make it open for everyone. Uh, uh, we and I will show you all the other things uh, uh, later on in this presentation how it works. So these are a few of the people who work on it. Uh, my colleague Irini Kariotaki, my right hand, who has been working over the past eight years with me on this project. Matthias Harer, who is doing, who is developing the uh, the shiny apps and the the R tools that we made. 
David Ebert, and uh, a few. This, these are a few of the other people who were quite some of their time on this project. And okay, so uh, so this is also that's also can I use Meta Psi database for my own research? Yes, you can use the data. You can download the data. It's I will show it to you. And uh, you can download the R package and you can just use it uh, however uh, you want. Okay, now let's go to the website. I will show you the depression database, but you could also look at the suicide database, which has the same idea. It takes a while because it's a, it's a shiny app. I don't know if you're familiar with <coughs> with shiny apps, but shiny apps allow you to run analysis on a website with data in R without using R. And uh, so you don't need R to run the analysis here. So I will show you how it works. So here you see the website and uh, we will go now in the uh, left side to the option in the menu, select data. And here you see, come into a new screen and you see all the studies here in the middle with the, the hatches G and standard error. And you can download it all. So you can download everything uh, as a C, CSV, as an Excel or, or a PDF. So you can just download all data, uh, but you can also use a selection. And I will show you how that works. Uh, so for example, uh, we want to use, uh, we want to examine whether psychotherapy works in subclinical depression. Then you click on diagnosis and you only select subclinical depression and you, uh, let's say intervention type, you only want to use CBT. And then you click on all the other ones keep only CBT. And now you, you, have select, you will select the studies on CBT for subclinical depression compared to control conditions. Then you click here on update table. And then you see that there are two, four, six, eight trials examining the effects of CBT on uh, subthreshold depression compared to control groups. And then you can download these data, just as you can download all the data, or you can run directly online without anything, run a meta-analysis on this selection of studies. And here you see uh, the outcomes. So uh, the main results, you can use, you can, yeah, you can use all kinds of models to pool the studies. Uh, you here you see the overall effect size, which is 0.51. You see the level of heterogeneity, which is pretty high. Uh, you can see here the numbers needed to treat. Uh, you can see the uh, the prediction interval somewhere. Uh, you can uh, yeah. So you can also look at the plots. So you can look at the forest plot. You can look at out what happens if you exclude outliers. Well, there's one outlier, FASCAS 2017. And if you exclude it, uh, heterogeneity goes down, but also uh, the effect size goes down. This is a Borchardt plot. You can look at uh, publication bias, a P-curve, a funnel plot. Uh, you can uh, uh, you directly get the results of Eggers test. Uh, you can look at risk of bias, you get that directly. And you can look at moderator analysis. So you can select that here. So now you see a meta regression for a year and a subgroup analysis for country. Uh, and yeah, so, uh, so you run, and here you can also choose one of the other uh, characteristics to run uh, subgroup or meta regression analysis. So this is this is how you do it, and it's all the data are here. So you don't, if you want to know, you know, CBT and older adults, 
is psychotherapy effective in East Asia? Uh, does group therapy work in perinatal depression? All these things, you don't need to do a new meta analysis on it because it's all here. You can just run it. <coughs> and it's open. Everybody can do that. So now I'll go back to my PowerPoint. Yeah, so this is what I wanted to show about uh, the uh, MetaPsy project. And as I said, uh, we now have suicide and psychotherapy for depression compared to control conditions. But this will be extended uh, this year and we uh, will extend it more yeah, over the next couple of years. And, where, and when we have a new data set ready, it will be added to uh, the website. So uh, what we have done, so we, we do the searches uh, every year and we will probably, because, and that's still a lot, I mean, we update the uh, database for depression uh, every year, but that we always get, uh, we now get about 60 to 70, sometimes 80 new trials. And as you can imagine, that's a ton of work just to update it. So what we are now thinking of is that we should spread that more over the year. So we will probably move to three or four updates of the searches uh, per year because it's more efficient. For most databases, we use two independent researchers for inclusion of studies. And we also use two independent researchers for data extraction. That will probably not be true for all data sets, but we will add a description sheet for uh, what is uh, a double extracted and what is not double extracted. So what we, what we uh, these are the, the, the characteristics we extract. So we extract all kinds of participants, uh, the characteristics of participants, how they were recruited, the diagnosis, the age group, the target group, the proportion of women, the mean age, the intervention type, the format, individual group, uh, internet-based, number of sessions, the type of control or comparison group, the country, the year. We do risk of bias as, uh, assessments. We have started with version one uh, from the Cochrane. And they, but we will move slowly to risk of bias too. But you can imagine if you want to do that for 400 trials, that's a massive work, which is, uh, by the way, an important problem anyway. If you want to add something to these data, then you have uh, 400 trials comparing psychotherapy with control groups. It's a ton of work to do that. So we also collect, of course, outcome data, the mean standard deviation, and, and in both groups, <clears throat> we also collect the mean standard deviation and, and in both groups at pretest, because then we can calculate the response rates based on the, uh, the normal distribution and baseline. If these data are not uh, reported, we use other uh, outcomes like binary outcomes or a p-value or a t-value and convert that to HSG. And in some data sets, we also uh, uh, add uh, secondary outcomes like quality of life or suicide or things like that. And this is the format for the data extraction that we use across all the data sets. And we have a specific format, how that should be reported in the Excel file. So, uh, uh, and that's important because when you do that in the exact format, then you can use our R package to run the analysis. Yeah, so for, for, for uh, depression, we have all these different meta-analysis. We have published more than 100 uh, now. And I won't go. I won't go into the content because I'm talking about the methods now. But this is, uh, yeah, it's been very, uh, very uh, useful. Uh, yeah. So what we, one of the challenges we have is that we 
So we have this meta-analytic research domain of psychotherapy for depression. And then we do all these individual meta-analysis or network meta-analysis or uh, IPD meta-analysis. But it's still we still need to, when you want to make full use of this idea of the meta-analytic research domain, is that you have, have to have a systematic review of all the meta-analysis we have done in that field. And I've published a few of those, and one in 2011 and one in 2017. But we don't have a good method how to do that. So what I usually do is I, and I, I have to write a new one now because it's five years ago that the earlier one was published. Uh, so I, we, I, I have to find some kind of systematic methods to summarize all the meta analysis we have done so that we can really cover the whole domain, so to say. And I, 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 don't, I don't think there is a standard for how to do that, but I do think it is an important element of these meta-analytic research domains. So finally, I want to talk about the MetaPsy tools package in R. It's developed by uh, Matthias Hart. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's available now, so you can uh, get it yourself if you want it. Uh, you, can, you have to, uh, it's not an official R package yet, so it's still in development. We have beta versions, which work well, but they're not official. Uh, <clears throat> they're not an official R package yet uh, because it's still in development. Uh, but you can download it. Uh, you can, uh, if you go to the website, then you, you see all the details on how you can uh, install it. And uh, what is actually uh, what the what the benefit of it? I should mention Paula Cooper, who is also doing a lot of work for this. So Matthias Hager has a team of uh, of people working on the R shiny apps, but also on this MetaPsy tools package, which I think is a major step forward in doing meta analysis. So I won't I won't bore you with all the details, but it's it was specifically designed for the Meta Psy project. Still in development, I see that there's now a version zero point three point two, but now version zero point three point three is available. Here's the website where you can uh, where you can find all the details, and what is required is that the data, they have to contain a number of specific field names. And that is, uh, that's, that you, uh, that, uh, because, uh, yeah, because then you can use the MetaPsy tools uh, package, which uses all these specific fields, like for example, the study, the, the field for the study and the field for, how the control group and the treatment group are defined. And uh, when you've worked with meta-analysis, you know that you can uh, use data in a wide format where you have all the details of one study on one line, or you can work on a, a long format uh, where you have all data for each condition on one line. And that doesn't MetaP tools work. Uh, MetaP side tools works with both, so it's uh, uh, it's it's actually pretty cool. So it has uh, three modules, uh, actually two, but I, I mentioned three. It has a so if you if you have entered your data in the right format, you have a preparation module. So you don't need to calculate effect sizes in advance. You just fill in uh, mean, standard deviation, and n, et cetera, for, for all the data. And in the preparation module, you check automatically the formats and conflicts. You expand multi-arm trials because, you know, in our fields, many trials do not compare one therapy with a control group, but they include two types of therapy with the same control group. And that's complicated when you want to do a meta-analysis. So what we do, what, uh, what this preparation module does 
it expands these multi-arm trials into uh, yeah multiple comparisons and it automatically calculates effect sizes so at that you <clears throat> you only need to do that once so when you have done the preparation module you have done you have all the effect sizes you have everything you need to run meta analysis and then you go to the analysis module and uh, you yeah you you run a whole set of meta analysis all at once with one command and uh, that's then you can generate the plots you can run subgroup analysis and you can actually make use of all the commands of it available in, in the meta and meta4 packages in r but much simpler and much more detailed without yeah looking at all these all these specific functions so to say and one of the best uh, functions i think is that you that you automatically can create study tables in html format and so that means that you can export tables directly to word that, and that includes a descriptive table of the studies that you have included it includes outcome tables so with the effect sizes with all the sensitivity analysis and uh, uh, subgroup analysis so you don't have to what we used to do is we run a subgroup analysis and then make a table in words and then copy and paste or you know write these tables manually that's no longer needed because uh, with this function you can you just export it from uh, uh, r directly to word <coughs> So if you run the meta analysis, which is, I think, the most core uh, uh, syntax for uh, this, this package, it's just one command, run meta analysis, and then you put the data file between brackets, and you, you get, you, this generates all the outcomes from all models at once. And you can uh, you can do you can adjust it so you can give specific values or models for each of these uh, uh, different ways of uh, pooling the data, or you can just use the standard models. And as I said, you can use you can still use all the analysis available in the meta meta four packages. So these are the uh, pool effect, all the different types of pool effect sizes that, that are calculated. So uh, uh, I, I will go through all of them, uh, but you, it has also, also multi-level models, for example, which is usually, you know, it's a, a little more complicated than a normal meta-analysis. It also has these, uh, so you can, if, if one study has more outcome measures, uh, you can also pool them uh, within the study before pooling them across studies. Um, you automatically exclude outliers. You automatically do sensitivity analysis with the smallest outcome per study and one with the largest outcome per study. Uh, you will have this method of excluding influential cases, this method developed by uh, Wolfgang Fiefbauer and Chen. And so this is all done automatically. Uh, and this is the output. So this is what you see in R. And you just, you know, you copy and paste this to Word. And then you uh, remove all the things you want to include in your paper. Uh, or you report them all. Okay, I come to my conclusions. Yeah, I think meta analytic research domains are the next level of aggregations of RTC results. And I think it will become, with, a, with the increasing number of, of trials and the increasing number of meta analysis, this will become more and more important. The methods, they, they are not yet very clear. Nobody knows how to do that, uh, me neither. And so these methods that in the coming years, we will have to work that out in much more detail. And I think the MetaPsy project 
that's a nice combination of a series of marts on psychotherapies for depression. And I think it will, yeah, and the, the goal is to make all these data open uh, and include the shiny apps where you can just run a meta-analysis online. And so you don't have to write a paper about this anymore because it's simply available online. Yeah, and that, uh, I think the meta side tools package for R that is developed to support our meta side projects, but it can be used for any outcome uh, uh, meta analysis you do. And I think it will be a great tool for the defer further development of our meta side projects and for meta analytic research domains in general. And I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm ready here for answering all questions you have. But if you if you want to send if you have a question afterwards, just send me an email. Okay, then I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, thank you, Professor Kybers. Um... I'm sure uh, the audience would have uh, plenty of questions and. Uh, if you do have a question, feel free to use the chat box. I'll be monitoring that, or you can uh, signal me and turn on your mic and ask your question. Either way is fine. Um, so as uh, the audience perhaps type in their question, I will uh, <coughs> go ahead and ask the first one. And of course, uh, first of all, like this, this body of work is so impressive and it's such a huge contribution to to the field and, and it's so exciting to see how this will propel uh, next generation of research and researchers and advancing our understanding and knowledge uh, in psychotherapy and other domains of research. Um, Professor, I was wondering, uh, in your last remark, you said that uh, the metapsych tools can be uh, applied to non-RCT, uh, I guess as long as it's like an experimental design uh, we can use the same tools. Is there, does, does tweaking, uh, is it necessary to tweak it to apply it to other types of experimental studies? Uh, you, it has to be an experimental design. So you have to work with uh, two groups that are compared. And otherwise it doesn't matter. So if you, if you do a meta-analysis of lab experiments, that's also very well possible. But it has to have, you know, the formats of a meta-analysis of treatment outcome uh, trials. And, and many lab studies use the same formats, so to say. Right. If, if and... you want to examine, uh, I mean, uh, observational studies and the correlation between one phenomenon and the other, then it's probably better not to use it. Right. But as long as uh, it is in an experimental design where you have a control group or comparison group, yes. basically uh, any kind of outcome uh, would uh, doesn't really matter as long as there's some kind of quantitative outcome. Great. Exactly. Uh, do you think there we'll see a day uh, when uh, we can somehow bypass the very uh, labor-intensive, onerous uh, step of extracting uh, um, you know, through, you know, from PDFs, like, is there a way, is that, is that in the horizon where you will have some kind of, uh, tools or program to automatically extract, uh, the needed information, of course, uh, cross-check by human coders, but do you think that that is in the horizon? Yeah, I'm not sure. <clears throat> I think the selection of studies from bibliographic databases, there is quite a lot of research on that now. And we're talking with a, an artificial intelligence group now to help us with the identification of studies. Extraction of studies, uh, of data from published studies, I think we can go a long way, but it needs, uh, uh, I think for some variables, you need uh, uh, a human check, so to say. It won't be possible to verify everything. But what we could do, for example, is that we, we now do everything by two people. And what we, what we want to experiment with is that we do that. Uh, so rate it by two people. 
then uh, send it to the original authors for a check. And then it could very well possible be that one reader is enough. Uh, and when the original author uh, gives also her or his opinion about the ratings of the study. So that could be a next step, but that we don't know. We don't know, but it is a it, it is quite a quite a lot of work, and I hope that we can uh, simplify this process indeed. But until now, we're not there, and, and uh, you you don't want to make mistakes uh, because uh, yeah, you want the data to be represented as good as possible. So we don't want uh, you know unclear data in the in the data sets. Right, right, um, and. Is there a way for uh, users of the MetaPsych uh, website to know whether a particular analysis that they they have just uh, run has been published? In other words, because so there's so so many possibilities and combinations that one can play with, uh, mm -hmm. and someone might stumble upon a very interesting finding. And is there an easy way for them to know whether that particular analysis has already been <laughs> written up? some years ago? Uh, actually, what I hope is that uh, we don't uh, do that anymore. Okay. So uh, if you, if you, we have these data, you can just run a meta-analysis online and you, you don't need to publish a paper about it because you can do, you can check it right away online. So if you do a meta-analysis, then you should add something you should look at additional outcomes or you should use a different uh, anal analytic strategy or you, 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 yeah, so you have to add something useful to it. And just examining CBT for older adults in group format, that's not interesting enough to do a meta-analysis anymore. That's what I hope, because now, now we do all these small meta-analysis, which actually don't add anything. So it's, I think it's, if you want to do a meta analysis, it's much better to contribute to one of the uh, meta analytic research domains. Right. And so we, we work with a lot of people all over the world who uh, help with the data sets. And then they also, uh, they also publish with us on the data sets they've worked on. So, uh, and then, so there's so many data out there we shouldn't waste our time on doing one meta analysis on CBT for all adults in group format. Um, I think a lot of uh, perhaps uh, PhD students uh, are are sweating right now because um, you know, like meta meta psych might might uh, force them to change track in their uh, in their project. Uh, there's a question in the chat box uh, um, related to this, I guess, uh, by Su Chan. Uh, what is your expectation? Uh, the role of other researchers in in uh, in the research community. Uh, how should they uh, use your data platform, or how do they contribute to building uh, the domains that are existing or other domains in the future? What do you think? Well, if you if it fits within our domain, so we focus on psychotherapy for depression. You should send me an email, and if you have experience with doing meta analysis or systematic reviews, and you know a bit about extraction of data, and you want to contribute to one of the data, data sets, you're welcome to join. Uh, we, we have not worked, so we have a lot of people from all over the world working on this. And uh, we're always open for other people, as long as you have some you know, you have to, have to have some experience and you have to have time to work on it. And then you will publish, uh, you know, you can publish papers about it or as the first author, as a co-author. It's not our, not where we don't own it. It's a, it's a collaborative effort. And we coordinate it, but don't, o don't own it. Thank you. All right, several people have raised their hands. Uh, Francesco? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, by the way. It was very exhaustive and it's quite impressive. Um, what I wanted to ask is uh, related to the data extraction process, like especially in depression uh, outcomes. Many studies report um, outcomes uh, in a different way. They're very heterogeneous ways to report outcomes, for instance, for pharmacotherapy. 
any studies report changing the pressure symptoms without um, reporting pre and post values. Uh, so for these kind of outcomes, I'm just wondering how do you deal with them? If you still go through the same process as for regular meta-analysis, so you contact the authors and ask for, for more details or you, you, you exclude them, what, what's your, yeah, how do you proceed? Well, if they have uh, reported change scores, then we can just calculate effect sizes. So we don't need to contact the authors about it. <coughs> Uh, and you can, uh, uh, the, there are packages in R, which we also use uh, in the meta side tools to calculate effect sizes using different formats. So you don't have to give, have, to have the mean standard deviation. And, and if you have changed scores, that's also fine. And if you report uh, binary outcomes, so proportions of people responding or remitting, that's also fine. But some studies do not report enough data and we exclude them because we, the data, there are so many data that it's, uh, it's so much work to contact the authors about it. So we, we simply exclude them. And that happens quite a, that happens sometimes that we, that a study has been done well, but they don't report enough data to calculate effect sizes. And we exclude it. So uh, yes, yeah, so I have two more questions following this. Uh, isn't there like a problem of heterogeneity and uh, when you include studies with different kinds of outcomes? I mean, can you actually combine change in symptoms and post-intervention symptoms or binary outcomes without affecting the effect size? Well, that's, uh, that's in fact an empirical question. <clears throat> so do these outcomes differ from each other? They all measure the same thing. So if you, uh, if you calculate change scores, then you also look at the difference between two groups and you report them in terms of standard deviations. Mm -hmm. And that's the same for when you look at post-test scores. And because of the uh, people are randomized, you can assume that they are the same at baseline. And at the binary outcomes, there are, yeah, there, there are uh, methods to convert up to uh, uh, standardized mean differences based on the idea that the, the binary outcome is placed somewhere on the continuous outcome, on a continuous scale, the normal distribution. So, and there are, yeah, yeah. so there are ways to do that. Maybe uh, we, we have not found differences between these different types of calculating effect sizes, but I cannot, we're never sure whether that's, that may happen. Could be true. We don't know. And it, it depends on the field. So it's not a, uh, an answer. But what we do so that you use mean standard deviation and add, and if that's not available, you use ch change mm. scores. And if that's not available, you use binary outcomes. And if mm. that's not available, you use the P or T or whatever value. So uh, that's uh, that's done in most math analysis. I see. Uh, I'm just thinking because, for instance, remission scores, which is binary binary outcomes, can be quite misleading if you're looking at uh, depressive symptoms, for instance, severity. So you look at the change in symptom severity, but then you also collect uh, binary outcomes for emission, which might not reflect the same thing. Um, no, but you can. So you what, what the reasoning is, is that you have the normal distribution, which is a normal curve, mm. and that people who remit are somewhere on a line on that normal curve. And so based on this line on the normal curve, you can compare the two normal distributions. Although it's a line on the normal curve, you can still estimate the difference between the two groups uh, in terms of the standard deviation of the normal curve. That's the, that's the reasoning. Mm -hmm. There is, I forgot the name of the study, but there is this study. Uh, it's, it's, you can convert in this way uh, uh, the, the, the effect size to an auto ratio or the other way around. And uh, so that means that you can use uh, binary outcomes to estimate uh, 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 standardized mean difference, 
but also the other way around. And all uh, basic uh, software packages to, to, uh, to do meta-analysis, they offer this possibility. So if you work with comprehensive meta-analysis, for example, it's standard and included in this package. And the same is true for all these packages in R. And I guess you can also conduct sensitivity analysis to see whether there's actually a difference between exactly. studies with outcomes, with different outcomes. Yeah, you can yeah, always. Um, yeah, thank you. Just one more question following up on your first answer when you were saying that you would exclude studies that don't report outcomes in a, in a specific way. Um, isn't this a limitation of, of this software, this, um, this, this project of yours? You know, uh, what I realized is that PhD students and people who are running meta-analysis, they, you know, they, they relentlessly <coughs> contact authors for extra information and they ask several times until at least a small proportion of them reply and they get extra data. Um, so isn't your project based on only published research and isn't this like a, like a relatively big limitation, the software? It does not take into account like, everything. And if I were to conduct meta-analysis on a similar topic, chances are that I could find extra studies just because I, I took the effort to contact the authors and ask for extra information. Yeah, that's certainly true. I mean, uh, that's obviously true. Maybe there are, you know, of the 870 trials, there are 20 which we excluded because they don't uh, report the data. But if you contact the authors, you will only get a response from 10 of them. Yeah. And then you have 10 studies on 870 trials, which could have an impact on the outcomes. Uh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, good. But it's it's yeah. a, I mean that's if you if you do projects like this, the 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 the, the all the things you can do and should do and uh, mm. can do. I mean, it's 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 such a we work on this now for with fifteen people, mm. spend most most of that time on getting these data together. And so you 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 cannot do everything. It's yeah, it's, obviously it's, it's a massive volume of work. The with it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Uh, and uh, throw open. Um, I'm not sure whether I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's Tole. Sorry. sorry, sorry. Uh, Northern German name, very hard to pronounce. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kuipers, for giving your presentation. I don't know how often I cited you, and it's a big honor and pleasure to see you. Uh, speak to us. It's the first time I see you speak. It's, it's a big, yeah, it's very inspiring. Um, we are uh, actually building up a, a meta-analytic research domain in the field of PTSD in, at the University of Münster under the supervision of Professor Nechmedin Morina, whom I believe is a former colleague of yours <laughs> um, at the University in Amsterdam. And we might actually get in contact, let's see. But I have uh, two small questions in terms of um, the topics. Uh, as far as I understood, um, the main um, focus uh, was on uh, efficacy in terms of psychotherapy. And we, uh, in the field of PTSD, broadened our view a little bit also on potential harms um, and not on the group level, group means, but also we looked at um, whether there are people who deteriorate, whether there are people who uh, indicate that they had at least one adverse event or serious adverse event. And just out of curiosity, does um, your project also include negative events, negative outcomes in terms of psychotherapy? Uh, a few things. <clears throat> if you built a new uh, meta-analytic research domain on PTSD, the VA has, already, has that already, right? You know that. I didn't know that, in fact. <laughs> yeah, so they, they have the data extracted very extensively. And we are now... Uh, uh, so they update the data every year and have to have a very extensive uh, Excel sheet, so to say, with all the data. And what we are doing now uh, together with them is we, have a, we are developing an R code in which we extract the data that are necessary to, uh, uh, for our MetaPsy project. And so that we, when they do an update, we run the R script 
and integrate these results at Matlab Sci, uh, uh, the other Matlab Sci website. So uh, maybe it's good to see if we can collaborate uh, on this in one way or another, because it's, it's obviously one of the advantages of these meta-analytic research domains is that you don't have to do the work twice. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, up to you. But yeah, negative outcomes. Yeah, we, we, that's not in our main analysis. But um, uh, first is that we do a lot of IPD uh, meta-analysis. So where we get the primary data, <clears throat> we're actually doing one on PTSD now too. And then you have the primary data uh, of, uh, of all the trials, and then you can see whether people deteriorate. Uh, so we have published quite a few uh, studies on that. We've also uh, looked at, we've lo also looked in our database of studies, uh, if they report deterioration rates. Uh, and we did indeed, I think, 20 or 25 trials, we published a meta-analysis about that. So negative effects of psychotherapy for depression. <clears throat> it's not in our standard database, but for us, it's relatively easy to go through the studies and check if they report negative outcomes. <clears throat> uh, and another thing is that what is, what is an interesting approach, we did that last year in a paper in Acta Psychiatrica Scandinavica, is if you if you have the, uh, the the baseline mean standard deviation and n, and you have the post test mean standard deviation and n, then you can calculate response rates, for example, uh, because you can estimate the uh, you know at baseline people have a mean of uh, twenty, and then you know that the cutoff for a response is ten because it's fifty percent of the baseline rate. And then you can estimate in the normal distribution at post-test how many people score above 10 and how many below 10. <clears throat> and that's a method that was developed by Toshi Furukawa. And we, we did a meta-analysis on this. And you can use the same way, the same method to, to estimate the number of people who deteriorate. And we published a paper about that last year. So we, we, we calculated clinical significant deterioration. So you can use these data also to look at uh, 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 yeah, deterioration rates. Yeah, Great. but it, negative, so. negative, negative outcomes are still very understudied. So serious yeah. adverse events are hardly ever reported at trials. Maybe we should look at it again in depression because uh, recent, more recently, more and more trials do report about it. Yeah, yeah it has been a, a sort of a blind spot in psychotherapy research for quite some time, but it's yeah. at least proving. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, we already um, extracted data of 153 trials in PTSD. Okay. So we simultaneously worked uh, with the colleagues in America without noticing, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, wonderful that uh, you are open for co uh, collaboration and uh, that would be great. We also looked at uh, adverse events rates incurred in, in comparison to com control groups and uh, in PTSD, we are about uh, to publish. Uh, it, it is actually the, the case that psychotherapy is quite safe. Now we there are enough studies that we can do meta-analytic research, and uh, it shows that it's quite unlikely. Uh, and in control groups like passive control groups, wait lists, it's way more likely. Um, so uh, yeah, it's 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 really interesting. Um, thanks a lot for your answers. Thank you. Any other questions? From the audience. Professor, are you aware of other um, uh, meta psych like uh, projects in other domains in, uh, in not necessarily in psychology, but in the medical field, for example, or other, other research domains? Are you aware of any uh, parallel or similar developments? Well, you have this large uh, study on antidepressants led by Andrea Cipriani and uh, Toshi Furukawa. 
uh, but it's actually one comparison. So they have uh, it's it's a network meta analysis of uh, and they are updating it and collecting primary data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in, in a way, it, it's it's very big. So I would say it's also a meta analytic research field. But it is about one type of treatment for one type of patient. So I'm not sure about that. Yeah, and I know Brad Thompson in Canada, who is doing all these IPD meta-analysis on, uh, uh, on the validation of depression scales. So they collect all the trials on the PHQ, the CESD, the HOTS, and then uh, includes only studies where they have done diagnostic interviews as a gold standard, where they compare the self-report rates with a gold standard. And they have also included hundreds of studies on different outcome measures with different diagnostic interviews. So you could see that as a, as a, as a, as a meta-analytic research domain. But I, I, I'm not... And that's the problem that you uh, you uh, you really have to know a field very well to see to know whether there are meta analytic research domains. Mm -hmm. And I I assume that people might use different names for uh, a similar process, making I think a different. Is, yeah. I made up I made up the name myself, and so it's not a not a standard name or anything. It will be. Now that you have put a stamp on it, it will be. Um, let's see whether any other questions from uh, the audience. What would be, uh, if you were to give uh, advice to perhaps PhD students who are, uh, before this uh, seminar, was intending to do a, 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 a traditional typical meta-analysis um, in something related to psychotherapy, uh, what would be your advice? Of course, they can collaborate with you and use uh, 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 join your group. But what, yeah, what would what would a, a burgeoning researcher? Uh, how should they approach this? Um, yeah, this new, new direction in, in how we understand. Yeah, that, that's a good question. That's a good question. I don't really have a good answer to that. I mean, it's all new, and it's all. I also don't know what to do and what not to do. I, th I do think that it's worthwhile to collaborate. So you can collaborate with me, but if there's another group working on PTSD and they also have a lot of meta-analysis, then you can also uh, collaborate with another group. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's worthwhile to not do the work that other people have also done. And if you do new work, uh, then make sure that other people can benefit from it too. So try to find a specific comparison that has not been examined ex extensively. Or, uh, and that make sure that your data can be used afterwards by other people. Uh, I know that's not a really good answer, but that's the only thing I can come up with now. Yeah, and in a way, this will change the whole field. It, it will, you know, the data are just there. You don't need to publish everything because it's, it's just available. And I don't know what the consequences of that are. I don't. So I am also not completely sure whether it's only good. Maybe it's good if you have these small meta analysis and look at the thing. But the, they often also end up with different conclusions. So if your inclusion criteria are, are a little different from another one, and you you're a little more strict than that and less strict than that, then you can can end up with different conclusions. And then you have all these different uh, meta-analysis, but no good answer. And I think by, with this approach, you, you help build yeah, an infrastructure that we have the answers. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I know this is not a good answer, but I, I don't have more at the moment. The future no. will have to show it. Do you think journals would start uh, taking notice and, uh, you know, in the way they they um, evaluate uh, submissions that are perhaps um, meta analytic in their approach, that they would to some extent point towards like meta psych as you know sort of like the gold standard, that in some ways maybe ten years from now like they won't they will stop publishing 
traditional meta-analysis and ask for something like meta-psych? Do you think that that well, day will come? I, I think many journals already ask uh, uh, authors to make their data open. <laughs> so that will uh, at least allow other researchers to make use of the data you have collected. And then it's, uh, then it's indeed, uh, the next step will indeed be that this will be somehow a collaborative effort uh, of the whole field, not my, my effort, but an effort of the field where everybody can build on. And I, 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 that, I think that's where we should go to. I'm not sure how journal editors will think of it. I am a journal editor myself, so I will certainly think of it, but I'm not sure whether this will be supported by all editors. It's, I, I, do, I don't know. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. But I do think that open data uh, stop replicating unnecessary work that has already been done by others. I do think that's the way forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay, there's a question asking about the consistency of uh, the inter-rater reliability, given that maybe over the years uh, the raters have changed. How do you keep track of uh, or ensuring that the, uh, the consistency of the coding? Yeah, that's a very good point. So what we do is uh, I try to rate all the studies and depression myself, which is quite a job. But I do that so that I keep uh, 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 that I at least know that the, the ratings in depression are consistent. But we have also developed an extensive manual where we describe all the uh, uh, data that we extract, with all the exceptions, all the you know the informal rules about how to handle this and how to handle that, and that's that's we do that consistently and it's we do we should update it but that's really very important to do that in the right way yeah very good point that's a danger of of uh, this approach that you yeah include studies from 50 years ago but that the rating system changed and then you didn't update uh, the the ratings yeah so we actually uh, did a huge a large update, uh, I think in 2015 or 16. So we redid all the searches. We redid all the uh, uh, inclusion process and we re-rated all the studies. And uh, I think, I guess that for, you have to do that once in a while to, 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 yeah, to make sure that there is no, that, that this will remain a good data set. Wow. Well. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so you, you mentioned that uh, currently you're aiming to do three to four um, updates uh, a year for a certain database. Do you does does that process involve um, uh, doing a search from scratch, or do you just look at the particular year um, each time you update? You're looking at the 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 interval. Of, Three or four months, or how do you do? How how, how does your team do only it? Updates. Only updates. So we okay. we use uh, the we look at a, the previous year, and right. then we do searches limited to that year. Otherwise, it would be you know we we I don't know. I think we have thirty five thousand hits now. If we would do that every year again, that would be quite a thing. Do you think there's a way to automate that process? I guess this is similar to a question I asked earlier, but instead of having to, you know, physically, manually do this uh, several times a year, is there a way to extract uh, the uh, needed, paper, at least the papers? Yeah, I think I think it, it is possible to uh, to to. So you these people working in artificial intelligence, they have developed tools to. With a certain, with a level of certainty, whether a study meets inclusion criteria or not, so then you maybe you know seventy five percent of the studies can be excluded based on a ninety nine point nine certainty that they don't meet inclusion criteria, and then you only have to rate twenty five percent. And we're working now with this group to see, yeah, where. Uh, mm. How far? How 
can we reach the 75% or can maybe we can reach 90% or we don't want to miss studies, obviously. So, but at some point you, uh, yeah, we, they, they can uh, certainly uh, uh, give the certainty that some records do not meet inclusion criteria. And then the more, the, more, the larger your search is, uh, the better the algorithm becomes. So it's. Uh, uh, I do think there is a lot of a lot, a lot of uh, uh, work to be gained. Yeah. And related to that, obviously, uh, you're you're uh, limiting the search uh, to uh, publications that are in English. I assume. Um, yeah. So so of course, uh, perhaps there are uh, tons of uh, uh, work that is done that might be relevant published in other languages. What do you think would be a good way to bridge these different um, body of uh, uh, knowledge? Well, we don't, we do not only include trials in English. We also include trials in Dutch, obviously, but also in German, Spanish, Turkish, uh, French, uh, because we have people for working uh, from these countries on our databases. But the number of studies trials in these languages is very small. So most people publish their trials in English. Mm -hmm. And that means that we, it hardly ever happens that a trial is not published in English. The only big exception, exception is Chinese. And we are doing now, uh, uh, so we have, we have been working on one meta analysis uh, on CBT for depression. Uh, in which we also searched in the Chinese major Chinese databases. And we came up with quite a few trials that were not published in English. And we're doing that for specific uh, comparisons now. But we have not yet uh, done that for the whole database because it's quite, a, quite yeah, because it's, it's logistically complicated. Right. Yeah. So currently in the MetaPsych database, uh, you have non-English uh, trials included in that in, in the database. Is that correct? Some, yeah, some in Spanish, right. some in German. Yeah. Oh, great, that's great. Thank you. Um, I'm aware of time. We still have a couple of minutes. I want to see whether there are any last questions that a uh, member of the audience would like to raise. I see. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I will sorry. use the time. <laughs> um, okay, sure. You yeah. also, thank you. You also um, uh, showed that there were possible moderators of effects uh, and, for instance, a number of sessions. And I was wondering, because this was one research question in the past of ours, uh, whether you also look at frequency of sessions as a um, yeah, clinical variable that can be malleable, so that can be changed quickly and might be a, a good target for clinical practice. Did you look at this? Yes, yes, we did. We published a paper in 2013 in which we looked at the number of sessions, the contact time, so the total contact time and the frequency. <coughs> and we found that only frequency is related to the outcome. So we only looked at individual trials so individual uh, uh, therapy, not group therapy. Uh, and that's what we found. We're currently updating this and the data where I think now somebody is running the analysis to see if that still sticks. Uh, and so we did a new trial to examine uh, uh, this association between frequency and outcome. And we confirmed that in a new randomized trial. So if you give therapy twice a week, it's more effective than once a week. My internet was quite unstable. Uh, uh, did you hear my answer or not? Sorry, you can hear me. Thank you very much for your answer. Okay, great. Um, it is uh, 4.30 our time and 10.30 in the Netherlands. Um, so uh, once again, thank you so much, Professor Pimkaipers, for this 
really fascinating and exciting. Uh, maybe a little bit um, daunting uh, as we are uh, entering this uh, a new era of uh, thinking about research domains. And uh, we look forward to um, welcoming you uh, virtually again before hopefully uh, in person uh, later this year. Um, and so I uh, asked the audience to join me in uh, showing our appreciation to Professor Prim Kaifers. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we wish you good health uh, as you're recovering from your flu. Your flu. Um, uh, it doesn't take a meta-analysis to tell me that you need to drink uh, plenty of water and get a lot of sleep. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.